Russian-American writer Masha Gessen won a prominent award, the Hannah Arendt Prize, in Germany yesterday. But it followed a series of events that nearly derailed the entire ceremony. Multiple sponsors pulled out, the venue was moved, and attendance declined. Why? Because Gessen, a Jewish descendant of Holocaust survivors, was accused of anti-Semitism due to a recent piece they published on Israel, the Holocaust, and Gaza. I spoke with Masha Gessen, a staff writer for The New Yorker, earlier today. Masha Gessen, thanks for joining me on the show today, and congratulations on winning the Hannah Arendt Prize. Uh, I do believe, and I've seen the reporting, that the prize was, the ceremony was scaled down and delayed. And so I have to begin by asking, and sorry, I feel like a Fox host asking this question, but was there an attempt to cancel you, uh, you, a Jewish descendant of Holocaust survivors, by some in Germany this week, because of your views on Israel and Gaza? Is that what happened? That is what happened. Uh, I share your dislike for the word cancel, but uh, so let's say I wasn't canceled, but the prize ceremony was canceled. Uh, the discussion at the university that was supposed to follow the prize ceremony was canceled. Uh, then the organizers of the prize, who who were uh, wonderful, hospitable people who really stood by me, they organized an alternative scale down um, prize ceremony at the Institut Francais in uh, Bremen, and that was canceled. So in the end, uh, instead of a large sort of banquet dinner, we had a dinner at a private house for 14 people to scale down to from about 400. Um, and then literally a back alley uh, prize ceremony. It was in a sort of semi-permanent community space uh, heated by a pot-bellied stove. Wow. Um, it, was, it was terrific uh, and it was, it was very much in the spirit of, uh, of what my article was about. So let's talk about your article that, that prompted the, uh, the German criticisms and controversy in your New Yorker essay, In the Shadow of the Holocaust, which is phenomenal. I urge everyone to read it. You talk about Gaza in the 17 years up till now, under the siege, under the blockade, being, quote, a ghetto, not like the Jewish ghetto in Venice or an inner city ghetto in America, but like a Jewish ghetto in an Eastern European country occupied by Nazi Germany. You also say the Gaza ghetto right now is being liquidated. Can you just briefly unpack that pretty strong analogy for our viewers tonight? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, that is very much the point of the essay to me, is, is that short p passage that you just read out, and that's also the passage that caused all the controversy in Germany. Uh, for a long time, people in the human rights community and sort of in the media have used the analogy of an open-air prison to describe Gaza. If you think about it for a minute, I have no idea what an open-air prison is. Uh, I don't think it's a thing yes. that exists. And, and the thing about metaphors is that they have to call up a or, or analogies. They have to call up something that we can imagine. Uh, and when I thought about what Gaza really is, Gaza under siege, so Gaza before October 7th, uh, it is most like a ghetto. There are significant differences, and I'm not saying that there aren't. But the closest analogy that we have to Gaza, which is an isolated, immiserated, hyper-densely populated uh, space that is controlled by the people who built the fence, but isn't governed by that but is actually governed by a force that is, in many key ways, enabled by the people who built the fence. Uh, so the reason that I think it's important to use the, uh, the word ghetto is because it gives us language for what is happening now, which is that the ghetto is being liquidated. And the reason I think that's important is because after the Holocaust, humanity said, never again. Well, in order to make Never Again not an empty slogan, not a magic spell, but an actual political project, we have to have tools for recognizing when something like that is happening so that it actually can yeah. ha not happen again. And I think something like that is happening in Gaza, or at least I'm making the argument that there's good reason to think that something like that is, is happening in Gaza. And that poses the question to the world, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to make good on the promise of 
never again. So, Masha, it's not just in Germany uh, that people are getting all worked up. There is this frenzied, almost hysterical debate here in the U.S. right now, especially in relation to college campuses, as to whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. The House recently passed a resolution declaring it is. Uh, and there's this IHRA anti-Semitism definition, which basically says comparing Israel to Nazi Germany is in any way is anti-Semitic. Again, given you are the Jewish descendant of Holocaust survivors, what do you make of this use, some would say, abuse of anti-Semitism in the criticizing Israel context? It scares me, because I know that anti-Semitism is real. And when people lump into the same uh, pile things that are anti-Semitism, such as actual violent attacks, which have happened here in Germany, which have happened in the United States, uh, you know, I wrote about the Squirrel Hill attack not that long ago. Uh, there is actual anti-Semitism, including, I believe, on college campuses. But when things that are not anti-Semitism, things that are legitimate political critiques of, of Israel, uh, or even not legitimate political critiques, but not essentially anti-Semitic critiques of Zionism, they should not be lumped together with, with, with anti-Semitism. That actually puts us in more danger that, rather than protects us. One last quick question, Masha. When you hear elected Republicans like Elise Stefanik pretending to care about Jewish Americans while endorsing an anti-Semitic great replacement theory, while supporting an anti-Semitic presidential candidate, what do you make of that, I don't know, cynical use of anti-Semitism to score political points? Well, I see it as being connected to a worldwide trend. We have seen uh, right-wingers in Germany, the IFD, uh, right-wingers in Poland, who were fortunately just voted out of power, uh, right-wingers in uh, in Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, the, I'll call them right-wingers for simplicity's sake, and now in the United States, using this, uh, you know, riding anti-Semitism like a political horse, because no decent human being or no human being who doesn't want to be uh, to be to be heavily criticized can reject anything that is done in the name of fighting anti-Semitism. Yes. Even what's done in the when what's done in the name of anti of fighting anti-Semitism is anti-Semitic, as I think Stefanik's use of anti-Semitism on college campuses is profoundly anti-Semitic. The trope that she is using uh, in in these hearings and her campaign to get rid of these university presidents yes. is that the Jews control the money that goes to the universities, and so she just has to draw uh, attention of the Jews so, so that they withdraw very... their um, their billions. And you know what? It's happening. That's a very good point. Masha Gessen, sadly, we're out of time. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Appreciate your insights. Congratulations on your prize. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mandy.